I'm a graduate of Parks College, um, started in the Air Force at Wright-Patterson and um, was in the Air Force for two years and stayed an additional six years working in research. And then I returned to McDonnell Douglas and stayed there for 30 years and finally ended up at Parks College again as an endowed chair. And uh, at McDonnell Douglas, what, were, what was your work there? Uh, it involved uh, a lot of high-speed work, hypersonics. Um, we worked on things that flew from Mach 4 to Mach 12. We had some airplanes that flew Mach 12 all the way around the world. And just for the benefit of people, can you just explain what, you, what the Mach okay, refers to? Mach, Mach number is how many faster than the speed of sound you are. So literally a Mach 12 airplane flies about 12,000 feet per second or about um, uh, 14,000 miles an hour and if it could, it could fly all the way around the world. Uh, almost built it. One of the more interesting nights I had was one of the things I did, of course, when you're a lieutenant in the Air Force, is you get these wonderful assignments like your office, the assistant assistant officer of the day. And one night I was the assistant to the head officer of the day over at Patterson Field. And we had 151 phone calls come in of objects flying down interstate, well, at that time, US 40, then turning at Columbus and going up to um, Detroit. Um, and these were state policemen, uh, some doctors that were up late at night, all kinds of people that reported seeing us. We had radar tracks on them, had airliners call in that they had seen them. Uh, very, very interesting. And each one that called in, I had to run over to FTD and take the thing over. And if I didn't get back in time and the poor colonel got awoken by the next call, <laughs> I got balled out. <laughs> but that was a very interesting night. And these guys, as I said, were not, you know, people who weren't used to seeing evidentiary sites and things like that. I mean, they were very clear descriptors of what they saw. Probably more than half of my career that was in projects that were classified or compartmentalized. Can you describe how that process works? Well, generally, um, you, ha you have to, depending on the level of the compartmentalization and, and the secrecy level, you have to go through a fairly significant background check. It takes between six months to a year to get the background checks. And then when you do that, then you generally, if you're in a very tight compartment, then you have to sign a statement that you, you will not divulge the existence of the project or even answer a question that could divulge the existence of the project. And uh, it's, on a, it's not an, even on a need to know basis, it's on a basis of people being identified specifically to know what you're working on and directly associated with the project. So it's very closely contained material. If you have a covert project, the funding would come through a number of government sources, none of which would be identified to the workers. Uh, whatever higher level you know, people were involved in it, even they might know, might not know where the funding came. It's just that you sign a contract with the US government and the funding would show up at the right place at the right time. If there were, if there were uh, non non-earthbound sources of the information. You would, at least at the people that were doing the design work or doing the analysis work, would never have any idea of where it came from. Um, all you would have to do is visit Russia to see how they did it. Um, they would compartmentalize every project into what I used to call silos. And they would have a colonel or a colonel general sitting on top of that. And literally, they could not talk to anyone outside of that silo. And if someone else needed help, one person would be sent over to another place, sit down at a desk, look at a piece of paper, say, yes, I know what that problem is. Here's the answer to it, and walk away. He would not even know what it was that he was working on. There's giant triangles that appear over Palmdale that move very slow. So they may be different triangles from so they have these, the ones that I've heard about have these glow around them and uh, they, they're, they're 
very large and very slow moving. So that's different, I think, than the ones that appear all over Belgium and that that are very fast moving. The ones that appeared over Belgium that move very quickly in a few seconds, no, you, you can't explain that in unconventional physics. Just like if you use, con by conventional physics, I mean engines and jet engines and rocket motors and propulsion systems as, as we know them today. You put fuel in, you burn something, and it produces thrust, and it accelerates an object. Um, in, in that context, no. And in the con that kind of physics, you cannot explain any, hardly any human beings living long enough to go much, much beyond uh, the, the edge of our, of our little solar system because it, it, it takes almost 13 years to get to the outer edge where the Kneeper belt is and some of the uh, outer, outer things that are, that are going around with, uh, with Pluto and Charon and those things. So that's 26 years round trip. So you're not even out to the edge of the heliosphere where the edge of the sun's uh, interaction is with, the, with free space. That's three light years away and that would take a, a hundred, 150 years. So in, a, in the conventional terms, no, you can't explain it. It has to be, if the physics that have to explain that are quantum physics in which things can appear to be almost two places at the same time and appear and reappear just like uh, positrons and electrons do in, in some of the um, uh, high energy particle colliders. It's probably not anything pushing it through the air. It's it's a, it's a coupling of, of of the device with the energy that permeates space. Probably Tesla was as close to it when he said that if given the right uh, energy system, the right the right uh, electromagnetic spectrum, I can power a, a a human base on Mars from Earth without any loss of energy. In the, and in, in quantum physics and zero point energy, that's a possibility. But literally, um, Sakharov and the, n the number of people that were working on it, I think, are very, very convincing arguments that the fabric of space is like an ocean, an uh, energy ocean, in which solid energy is floating on it, and solid energy is the mass. And if that's true, then the gravity waves of, exist and in fact, everything goes back to heavy sides equations, and it's waves, not particles. And the quantum is now not mass, but time. And if that's true, then there's a whole different, you look at the whole universe in a different light. And then a lot of things become possible that we think impossible within our current understanding of what time and space and thrust and force and all that is. If they come from the other part of the universe, if there are craft that travel, galaxies on the average are 10 million light years away. And even our, our galaxy is about 100,000 light years across. All of the conventional thrust and force mechanisms that we conceive of just won't work in terms of human time frames. That's the only explanation I can get, is that, that if, they, if people are here from another civilization, then they have, they've understood the, the, higher, the, higher, the finer points of quantum, quantum physics and how to couple that from particles into beings that can do what, quantum, what, what particles can do now. When I was at Wright-Patterson, we had the flying saucers that went up. I think they covered the distance from Columbus to Detroit in something like uh, equivalent of about 20,000 miles an hour. It, I don't think anyone in the, con in the ordinary aerospace business would have had any knowledge of what they were even talking about if you mentioned quantum physics or, or wormholes or the type of things we know now because if you went to CERN and talked to the particle physicists, they would tell you certainly some of this was possible because they see it all the time. Where they think they see mass, they really see, uh, they really see energy frozen in a, in, a, in a time quantum. And what they're seeing is not, is, is just, 
is, is, a, is really a frozen bundle of energy. And it moves back and forth almost without any restriction. I thought there were enough credible stories that I may not be able to explain them, but they weren't phenomenon that were people's imagination. Whatever they saw was real, but I couldn't explain how it, how it was real, what made it real. But I think, what they, I think they saw what they saw. Near St. Louis, there was a fairly large triangular object scene, and it covered the distance down to South St. Louis in some, in some of its sightings, it was moving relatively benignly, but then it, it literally jumped about 20 miles in a sec, couple of seconds. And uh, I've received a lot of phone calls from the local newspapers and TV stations as how can that be? And I said, I don't know how it can be, except if you explain it through something like a quantum physics explanation of, of time and space. Uh, relationships that gave you time and space travel. But other than that, I don't, there's no way I know that I can put a, the biggest rocket engine I could think of on it, it still couldn't get there at that speed. And the noise and the sound you would make doing something like that would wake everybody up for 10 miles. And it made no sound at all. It, see, it starts out at hover and it literally almost disappears and pops over here. So it's not like it's not like a cartoon where it goes whoosh. It's almost like it disappears and comes up over here. Uh, at least the, the descriptions that some of the police officers gave to it. A lot of combat pilots routinely go up to seven and eight Gs, but that's a very specific direction. That's from your head downward along the axis of your spine. If you were to take that, what's called eyeballs in, which is when you accelerate the forces this way, uh, you literally uh, would have your eyeballs compressed out of their sockets and you'd have brain damage. So the, the Gs to do that might be in the level order of a thousand Gs. So no, that's not physically possible for any, even, even insects to take that level of acceleration, even over a short period of time. Uh, you might get, in an automobile accident, you might get 100 to 150 Gs, and that's when the car is completely crushed. So th that's what happened, would happen to a human being if that were a conventional force accelerator. So it's not a conventional force accelerator, because if there's people in them, human beings in them, or some, a, a being in them that isn't crushed, then it has to be a different way of doing it. The hard part is, to find a way to physically do that. You know, there are people who have been experimenting with zero-point energy or try to tap zero-point energy for years. Every once in a while, someone will do it accidentally. They'll call it cold fusion, but I don't think it's cold fusion. I just think it's a zero-point energy tap. Except for three people that I know, uh, no one has been able to control it. When it happens, it happens for a short period of time, and it's almost always destructive. It's like drilling a hole in the, the base of Grand Coulee Dam, and all of a sudden this jet of water comes out that literally has enough pressure to cut you in half. Um, without a valve on it, you can't shut it off. Um, there's one guy that, I, that, that a friend of mine actually visited in Ann Arbor, Michigan, that was, I consider, a mathematical genius that actually figured out a way to control it. He was so paranoid, he divorced his wife, left his wife and children, and went in hiding because he was terrified that someone would, would kill him for the knowledge that he had, the, the ability to, to tap this whenever he chose to and control it. We don't know where he, we haven't seen him in five years, I don't know where he is. You know, right now, today, you've got an energy problem with the price of oil. What do you think would happen if you introduced an ability to tap? Zero point energy represents about 40 to 50 megawatts of power per cubic inch of space. Um, that's a lot of power. That's f uh, 4,600 million watts of power. And if you could tap it, at will, then no one would have to sell gasoline or oil anymore. You would just tap into it. It, it, it would be, 
it would be like taking and going out to the Great Lakes and taking out one drop and using it. it would, you'd hardly miss it. <clears throat> and since it permeates the whole universe and it, it continually fluctuates as, it, as, as, the, as the, the matter and antimatter interact, uh, it's not like it's a steady lake. It's a, it's, a, it's a pool the size of the universe. So you'd never, for what we would use it for, you'd never even miss it. The only thing this one guy claimed that happened is if you bottle it and move it to another location and release it, he sounded exactly like Mr. Spock. He said you create a tear in the, in the time, time domain of, the, of, of local space and actually cause a problem, which he claims he did and he will never do it again, which is bottle and move it. The other part is that you're not going it doesn't work on conventional jet engines. One has to create an actual zero point energy engine to do that. This one guy in Ann Arbor, Michigan had one running in his basement, not connected to any power source whatsoever, sitting in the middle of a table and it had been running for a year. Yeah, of the ones I've seen, now that they're there, there's, there, they might be able to make a, an engine that would drive an automobile, or they might make a, a, a motor that would drive a pump for a well in Africa somewhere, or a generator to power a village. But none of them would have the have even the, the inkling of how you would build a 300 a, a ship the size of a football field and make it move at the speeds that that it, apparently it moved. And speed's actually the, the wrong word. What, what appeared to be changing in location at, in very rapid times. Because conventionally, we think of this as speeding through space, but what if it really acts like, a, like some of the high energy particles at CERN? They really transfer into energy and reappear over here, and there was no mass that went anywhere. Because all mass is, is solid energy. And if you find a way to move back and forth with that, the conventional wisdom is that a complex organic structure like us cannot transfer back and forth from energy to solid. But that's because we've, we've never seen it done. What you represent is uh, solid energy. Now what you, you see, you think you're solid, right? In fact, the distance between the atoms in your body are almost exactly relatively proportional to the same distance as the planets around the sun. So in fact, if you were to take, if you could, if you could look at your individual atoms, you would be 98% space. The, if, if, we, if, you, if, we, if you were the equivalent of a neutron star, which is only only the, the, the nucleus and the electrons compressed, you're, you would fit on the point of a pin. So when you really get down to what you're made out of, um, it, the total electronic, the total state of you is on the point of a pin. James S. MacDonald actually had an institute to study paranormal psychology. He was, it, that's why his airplanes were named Banshee and Phantom uh, he, was, uh, he was an Irishman who was very inter-Scotsman, very much interested in, in, the, in, the, in the spiritual world and the, para, and the, the paranormal. And he had uh, part of his research department working with a, a foundation he had to study the para, paranormal. And the great Randy, the magician, infiltrated his organization and actually for about a six months did sleight of hand experiments to get him tied to this, that there was something really there, and then he discredited him. The head of the research department um, would not even talk about anything related to this. In fact, the guy in, in Ann Arbor that had the zero point energy machine actually came to McDonnell Douglas. He and a couple of his partners came in, they were going to talk about this f funny hydrogen motor that they had. And I got invited to the meeting. And about halfway through it, I just said, guys, you've got a zero point energy machine. Why don't you admit it? And the head of the research department, who, is, who he thinks, quote, was discredited with put off, 
when they did, uh, Randy did this, had the guards come in and escort them off the planet, off the plant, because he was just so terrified of this. Uh, he thought it was pseudoscience. And I said, it's not pseudoscience. It's just beyond what we know right now. Um, but anyway, Randy would always say, I can't measure it. And what I would say is, I'm going to give him a ruler, and I'm going to say, now I want you to measure the diameter of an atom. Or I want you to measure, uh, uh, I want you to measure how, how, what's the distance between quarks. And the answer is, well, that device can't, isn't useful for doing that. So when he talks about radio instruments and electrodes and probes and says, well, I can't measure any, anything parapsychological, he may not know what is parapsychology. How do you measure it? The only people that I know that have come close are the Russians and their parapsychology institutes, most of which are all now defunct. But they had some very interesting twins that they were doing experiments with that they could find ways that they were, they were measuring something was occurring between the two, the two of them in their brain so they could actually know what the other one was thinking. And it's um, utterly amazing as to the, the spectrum of electromagnetics that are going on inside the brain. Uh, the Russians have done a lot with what's called scalar waves and different spectrum electromagnetics with the, within the brain. And they're convinced that it, you could explain parapsychology if you could ever find out what it is that you have to measure to prove that it's occurring. But they are only, they just got to the edge of perhaps measuring something, but they really quite weren't sure what to do or how to do it. It's all based on physics, but maybe you haven't got, maybe it is scalar waves. If it's scalar waves, then you're in a whole other avenue of physics, which are very controversial. Um, Tesla was very, very much into those. The difficulty with Tesla is that when he passed away, J. Edgar Hoover came in and confiscated almost everything. When his maid, when his maid discovered him, him dead, she didn't discover him dead. She discovered five FBI agents in his room <laughs> pilfering everything, and he was laying on the bed dead. Um, his nephew sued the U.S. government and won back, theoretically, all of his equipment, experiments, and records. There were theoretically 50 boxes. He got 45 of those in Belgrade. The other five are missing, and a whole bunch of stuff is missing. One of the guys did an experiment that he did in New Jersey, which was build a half-grounded antenna of a, a very unusual, a different configuration. Everyone said it wouldn't work. But in 1934, he met one of Tesla's assistants, who you worked with him in New Jersey, and he says, oh, well, you're hooking up wrong here. You hook it up like this. So in a rainstorm in Massachusetts, they hooked a little 10-watt receiver transmitter up, and the other guy went 50 miles away on the other side of a mountain. And in a rainstorm, they held a conversation over that antenna system without any noise, static, or anything else on it. We also found a record of a submarine that was in the Mediterranean in 1917, 1918. And, um, and Tesla in New Jersey put one of these antennas in the ocean, right off the coast and on the shore. And, it, it, and he's holding a conversation with the captain of the submarine. And uh, one of the guys actually dug out of the Navy records the log of the submarine. And it essentially says, some idiot who's claiming he is in New Jersey talking to me must be absolutely crazy because I know I'm 100 feet underwater and no one can be talking to me from New Jersey. And he had the matching language in his records, in his logbook, Tesla's logbook. So what was that? You know, people say, oh, it, it was an accident. It was a coincidence. It was an inversion of the white layer over here, you know. Um, there are a lot of things we can't explain that are going that people have actually done. Back when I was a young young engineer at McDonald in the 60s, 
we routinely designed for the Air Force and the Navy airplanes that flew at Mach 4.5 and, and 6. Uh, the, the Vietnam War interfered with most of that, but we had running engines that would fly Mach 6 easily. Uh, we actually had tested engines that would fly the Mach 12 airplanes. In fact, in 1966, a fellow by the name of Bill Escher, he's still alive working for SIC and SAIC in Huntsville, he had on a test stand an engine that was, now we can't fly at Mach 8 in a wind tunnel, but we can duplicate the pressure and temperature that the engine would see if it were attached to an inlet, which is what he did. And he actually ran an engine that got within 5% of predicted performance of an airstream that duplicated Mach 8 conditions at about 120,000 feet. And it ran for about 20 minutes. That was all the air supply he had. 1966. And we, we were convinced we could build them then. What's fascinating is I got to see the X-33 a couple weeks ago. And they had this new breakthrough of this new shingle technology that allowed the, the inside of the airplane to be room temperature or cold with these shingles that reflect the heat. They look exactly, they're, now they're a little bit thinner because they have a little bit better materials, but we built exactly the same structure in 65 and tested it to Mach 12 conditions. Um, almost the same standoffs a little bit more elegant than what we had because they have a little more elegant materials these days. But we were convinced we could do it then. People laugh at you and say, well, no, you couldn't, or no, it's impossible. We're not going to do that because it's risky. But no, it wasn't risky, and yes, it could be done. All it takes is a dreamer. See, can you imagine the Wright brothers if they one was a lawyer and one was an accountant? Why are you going to build a stupid airplane for it? It only carries one person. Who's going to buy it? What kind of profit margin are we going to get? God, we got 40% on bicycles. Why are we doing this for? Think of the liability. Everybody can sue us. It's a bad idea. Yeah, let's not do it. As long as we have that opinion, we're stuck. What you have to say is, by gosh, it's something that no one's ever done before. Let's try it. If I were to look at since my first introduction to UFOs as a young lieutenant um, to today, I would say you have to look at, uh, first of all, I believe there's a large number of covert projects that go on in the United States that none of us are ever aware of. And if you see some of those things, they probably bend your mind and they don't fit your con conception of what what an airplane or whatever it is. And so it seems to you to be a UFO. So I think maybe a large fraction of those are covert projects that we're doing or someone's doing that are earthbound and human beings. And, 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 and if you really knew the, the, what was behind them, you would say, yes, I, I can see how that works. But then I think it's like Project Blue Book. There's this hardcore 10, 15 percent or 20 percent that don't fit any explanation other than the fact that the, the, the individuals, the beings that are in them and came here, uh, came here by way of a process that we're not familiar with, that is time-space travel. And I, I firmly believe that some of those are like that the history of the world has been that the wrong individual getting that information can use it uh, for a lot of destructive things. Not everyone would use it for the betterment. Almost any, anything you can think of can be turned around to be used as a weapon. And when you get into these kind of energy, energy time transitions, whatever, I, and that's, I can't, I can't think of the best word. Um, it's, it's, it's what Tom Bearden says, that they could be used to just wipe out whole segments of the population and, and the earth, as well as they could be made to, to liberate us from all dependence on fossil fuels. Well, first of all, the, bl the, any, the ballistic missile defense system is probably um, 
a pipe dream in the sense that um, if what it's designed for is the, that you know where it's coming from. And when we had Russia, there was a 50-50 chance that you, you knew about where it would be coming from. Uh, with the rogue nations we have today, it's absolutely ludicrous. Um, it's the guy who walks in with the briefcase with, re re remember that in the 50s, they built a nuclear warhead that fit inside a Sparrow, AIM-7 Sparrow, which has an eight inch diameter body. And that was a quarter kiloton weapon. That'll fit inside any briefcase you can think of. Now the guy may die carrying it, but he's gonna die anyway, so what difference does it make? Uh, I'm far more afraid of that than, if, if people can, if beings can travel in time space, then anything we would put in orbit as a weapon would be like, like going against Genghis Khan with a firecracker. You know, it, it, it doesn't make sense. You know, when we talk about zero point energy, what that means is that when everything comes down to rest, there's still energy left. It's like sea level in, in, in the ocean. And there is a constant flow of energy between matter and antimatter as it annihilates itself and recreates itself. It, it occurs in stars. All of these big star factories you see now with Hubble is a continual exchange of energy. And although the average is zero, that zero may be a pretty high level above nothing at all. And what Sakharov and some of the physicists said is that it's this level that creates the background for the universe to exist. There's a group of Russians that use that tube to repeat an experiment that Tesla ran in Colorado Springs. When he ran it, he actually created, he tapped so much energy that the electric energy flowed back through the wire and actually destroyed the power, the, the power station at Colorado Springs. And when the Russians repeated it at Moscow Aviation Institute, they blew up the one megawatt power station at MAI. This was 1980. When I got involved in space again with Sandy McDonald and we started the, what eventually became National Aerospace Plane, uh, I met a group of Russians over in England at a conference and one of them had been involved in transmitting energy from an antenna on the ground to a satellite in orbit back down to Moscow with only about 10-15% losses. And he said the reason we can do this is this is a scalar wave projector and here's what it uses. And he opens up his loose leaf binder and says now you can't take any pictures of this or make any sketches, just look at it, and lo and behold, there's the tube I saw in Smilian, Yugoslavia. <laughs> and this was the antenna that what Kasper Weinberger was saying was the anti-ballistic missile thing, and he told me even then, he says, you know, if you ever go in the building, all you're going to see is an empty concrete building with a couple of cables, because it's not an anti-ballistic missile radar, it's a scalar wave transmitter. And finally, when the DOD got in there, they found an empty concrete building with a couple of wires in it, and they said, ah, oh, they pulled everything out. And Victor says it never was in there. So they actually, he claims he, he transmitted up to 10 megawatts of power from this station to satellite to Moscow and got about eight and a half to nine megawatts of power back received in Moscow. Uh, so they were on the verge of understanding how you do some of these um, unconventional things. Um, but I th all of that is now gone. I don't know where he is. Uh, he lost his job. His institute disappeared. Um, so a lot of that work just collapsed in the Soviet Union. That's the same tube that Tesla says he could transmit energy to Mars, the surface of Mars, and support a human colony or to the surface of the moon. So once you make a, once you break that, break through that, and you actually do that, then just think of the whole. That then fuel doesn't become a problem anymore in orbit. You just use one of these tubes to generate the power directly to the right antenna, and you you can you can fly to the moon. You can fly in orbit. You can do anything you want. I think 
it's like a lot of things the people that if there are a group of people in the world that, are, that have access to it I don't think they know how to let go of it because they're afraid who's going to get their hands on it even though there'd be a tremendous benefit to mankind and in, in, in getting us energy sources that we wouldn't um, have the problems we have with today they're also worried about that somebody could take that same energy source and do the equivalent of what they did with the coal of instead of blowing a hole inside just obliterating the whole ship it's like trying to describe uh, Casper the Goat, the friendly ghost. Uh, you might see a cartoon of him, but you don't know how big he is, you don't know where his funding comes from, you don't know how many there are because of the compartmentalization and the oath that people have to take. Um, I mean, I know people today that worked on one of the things that I worked on, that if you ask them did you, do you recognize this name? They would, even if I can show it to you on the internet, there's some things that have come up recently on the internet where some of the stuff that I was associated with, their names are now on the internet. They would say, no, that's, I have no idea what you're talking about. In their, in their 70s now. But they still absolutely would never admit that they even know what you're talking about. So you don't know. You have no idea. But it's probably it's probably larger than you think. And again, that there's a reason for it, and that is you don't want people who would be hostile to you to know what it is you could do to them if they really caused a major catastrophe. Uh, because if they knew that, you wouldn't prevent them from doing it. They would just do it another way. And that's, that's the hard thing to do this today. I mean, who would ever think in Japan that a group of Japanese citizens who are normally the most controlled individuals you've ever seen would release sarin gas in their, in their underground uh, metropolitan train system? I, I, it just blew my mind that, that, they would, that they did that. The possibilities of UFOs are much uh, superior than we think. Really, um, probably, it's, uh, it's hard to say that, fly, uh, that uh, uh, unidentified flying objects uh, uh, fly. What does it mean, fly? Uh, we, a, pl a plane flies because it has a sort of importance. But uh, probably, 